everybody one message before we get started. If you're looking for a place to give you some ideas to help invigorate your congregation, why not head to Turnaround 2020? This year's guests include Nelson Searcy, Charles Arn, and Elmer Towns. It's October 22nd through 24th. It's in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's brought to us by our good friends at Church Central. For more information, you can head to turnaround2020.com. Okay, here's your program. Hi everybody, I'm Chris Yaw. Welcome to Church Next. It's a place where people who are passionate and interested in building healthy congregations come to learn from experienced mentors. Why are there so few young people in older churches? Could today's young adults be looking at worship differently than their parents? Well, of course they do, and it's increasingly important that existing congregations take seriously the spiritual journeys of younger people, which is what my next guest has done a lot of research about. He's Stephen Cady, and he's a United Methodist elder and PhD candidate at Princeton Seminary, who's looking at where young people experience God and where they don't experience God in worship. And Stephen, welcome to Church Next. Thanks so much for joining me. And why don't we start right, right there? Where do Kids or, or, or and, and or young adults, uh, where where are they finding God in worship? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, honored to be here and to be able to speak about this. It's something that I'm very passionate about, as uh, hopefully my research will play out. Uh, basically, the short answer to your question is it's complicated. Uh, I started this research project for my dissertation, hoping to go into United Methodist churches and to basically figure out where young people are encountering God in worship. And what I found was that the young people I interviewed weren't encountering God very often, and when they did, it was hardly ever in worship. Uh, and so I've been trying to figure out why that is and what we can do about it as a church. Huh. Um, and would this be different, uh, and I'll call upon your research that you've, that, that you've done, I'm assuming you've done, uh, historically? Uh, it, I mean, w w would, would you have been able to ask younger people of previous eras um, these questions about experiencing God and gotten different answers? Well, I think it depends on which point in history you touch down, but certainly in our Methodist history, uh, uh, I'm Methodist, and I know you're probably not Methodist, but uh, in, in my Methodist history, there are certainly lots of precedent for young people to encounter God in worship. In fact, the whole Wesleyan uh, understanding of spirituality was grounded in, in worship. Jeffrey Wainwright, who's a Methodist liturgical theologian, speaks about worship as the point of concentration at which the whole Christian life comes into focus. Uh, and certainly John Wesley affirmed that one of the main ways people come to faith was through the means of grace, and at least four of the five means of grace that he talks about have their they're not only place, but they're home in the worship service of the church. Certainly you can pray uh, on your own, and certainly you can read scripture on your own, but communion is something that you have to do together, and scripture reading and prayer all happens within the context of worship. So I think it's always been supposed to have been the, uh, the point at which uh, all life comes into focus. Whether or not it has been for young people in the past is hard to tell, but it seems as if that was the case. Okay, okay. And so let me back up because that was kind of a dramatic statement that you made. You, you went into this, and I'm assuming, Stephen, that you, you were, uh, uh, you were, you were going to find all kinds of different places where younger people were finding God in worship. And, and the fact that you, they weren't finding God in worship, was that a bit surprising to you? Very surprising. And in fact, like I said, I was expecting them to be able to name multiple times when they found God in worship. Maybe that was a little naivete on my part, yeah. but it, you know... I, how I found these churches was I asked our the conference, you know, what are three churches that have robust youth ministries within this conference? And, and I narrowed it down by several other factors, one of which was that they had to have a youth minister on staff, they had to have had an established youth program for at least five years, and they had to have multiple offerings for youth other than youth groups. So they had to have retreats or mission trips or other kinds of things youth buyers in some cases. Yeah, so, so you're looking kind of for some, some sort of consistent um, and, and uh, as you say, robust, uh, but, but, but well-equipped and well-intentioned uh, youth program from the leadership's point of view anyway. So the churches, it was clear that these churches took seriously youth ministry and that the youth ministry was respected by other churches within the conference. And I narrowed it down to three, all within the same annual conference, so that I would, and within basically the same demographic uh, within, the, within that, socioeconomically and uh, ethnically, uh, the same sort of diversity in each of these congregations. And 
So I was expecting, because these churches had robust youth ministries, that I could at least ask them, where do you experience God? And they could answer that question to some extent. Maybe it wasn't, if it wasn't in worship, then they could name it at summer camp or something like that. And what I found was that very few young people were able to say, this is where I experienced God. And of those, almost none of them, with, with maybe one or two exceptions, said it happens within worship. And none of them, zero, said it happened within worship in their local congregation. Really? Okay. And then par par parse that out. How come? Well, there are, I think there are a number of different factors going in, and if I could name one specific one, we could all fix it and go on about our business. But one of them is, you know, over and over again, young people express to me they just don't understand why this matters. In other words, over and over again, the young people were saying, I just want to be someplace where it feels like everyone else wants to be there. And when they go into the worship service of their local congregation, they're looking around and they think, nobody else wants to be here either, and I'm just willing to name it. So one thing that I've always appreciated about working with young people is that they're willing to name a rat when they see it. Yeah, and, yeah their filter isn't quite as uh, you know, diplomatically equipped yet, is it? Right. So, so when I sit down, I met with both parents and youth as well as uh, focus groups of youth, as well as the youth minister and the ministers of, the, of these churches, and sometimes the youth supervisors. And what was interesting to me is that the parents had the exact same answer. answer. They just didn't, weren't willing to express it in quite the same way. In other words, parents were saying, I want, I want to be in the worship service because I think it's important for my youth to be there, for my kid to be there. And kids were saying, I, I want to be there because I know my parent wants me there. What's different, what, what's the same about the, both of those is that neither of them want to be there. And there's, they don't see why it matters. There's nothing that extends beyond uh, Sunday morning for them. And there's nothing that gives them life or is life-giving and certainly nothing that helps them encounter God. Uh, so that, that's part of what I'm trying to unpack right now. And, and I can imagine, I mean, just the repercussions of what you're saying, Stephen, towards church leadership, towards the way, I mean, these ministers who've gone to seminary, spent thousands, tens of thousands of dollars on uh, real estate, on education, on all these things to help uh, others uh, experience God and to hear something like this is, is um, I, you know, I hope enough of them buy your book. Yeah, well, uh, I, uh, I hope so too. I hope to finish writing it at some point here, but... Uh, you know, I, I guess one of the things that I'm playing with right now is that it seems like what youth are looking for is weight. In other words, I think they're looking for magnitude and not in the sense of size. I don't think it matters the, the size of a congregation or that they have, you know, all of the youth from the local, you know, junior high there. I think what matters to them is that when they go in, they understand why this has impact, why it has magnitude, why it has weight for their lives. So, so kind of a relevancy? Uh, yeah, I, I shy away from the term relevancy just because I think so much in our culture tries to go towards relevancy with this in a sort of a consumerist sense. In yeah, other that, words, I mean, that's the problem be, with language, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I, I hear that term a lot, and it came up a lot in my interviews, and part of the, my, my only challenge with that is when someone says, well, I just need, that, I need the sermon to be relevant to me, uh, it loses the focus of what worship does, which is not just about what I get out of it, but what I put into it, and that, I'm, and that it's not about us, it's about God, right? So focus, turning our attention away. So relevancy, I think, matters for sure. It matters that we are speaking about issues that matter to young people. Uh, but beyond that, I think it matters that we're just speaking in ways that help us live our lives together and, and rehearse. For me, what worship is, it's a rehearsal for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the thing about a dress rehearsal is that it doesn't make sense if the whole cast isn't there, right? You can't perform it in the world if you don't have everybody there who's willing to put their time and effort and energy into it and, uh, and then live it in the world. Right, right, right. So, um... So when you, you talk about what youth are looking for is, is weight, um, I want you to unpack that a bit because it is a bit, there is a touch of relevancy in there. I'm gathering from the word you've chosen, there is a sense of challenge in there. Um, yeah. There is a sense of, um, okay, this matters, I get it, and I'm willing to invest in it. Yeah, so I think too often we think when we, almost all of these churches, an example would be all of these churches in the last decade have added a contemporary worship service. 
and their goal, stated or not, certainly stated by the parents and certainly understood by the youth, was that this service was, a, was an attempt to reach out to the young people within that church. To give them weight. To give, to give them something to go to, right? We, they think we're going to add this service and therefore, and then we'll have young people come to us. And what every youth who I met with, with the exception of those who were involved in the worship service itself, so those who were playing guitar or the drums or something like that, all of the other youth said, you know, I just feel like it's cheesy, I feel like it's pandering to me, and it just doesn't seem to matter. And it feels like it's for my parents or that people are trying too hard. I think what, we're, what youth are longing for is the same thing that everybody else is longing for, help with understanding what, what it means to be a person and to live as a person of faith within the world. And if it doesn't matter, they'll go and look for it someplace else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think part of what I, what I mean by weight is, is sort of magnitude. But magnitude, not just in the sense of size, but in the sense of meaning, that it, that it has something that they can hold on to and say, yeah, I understand why this matters, and I can go out from here and utilize this someplace in the world. And Well, I think one reason that uh, you know, well-meaning congregations, and, and, and I, you know, of, of course it may be easy to say, well, we're going to build this because then we'll get more youth here or whatever, but um, I, I would also guess that there was some sort of sincerity in saying, well, how can... You know, we best minister to to our young people in, in, in terms of n- not necessarily being about getting numbers of kids in there past fine parents, but but really trying to address the spiritual questions and um, longings that young people have. So I, I guess what I'm, tr- what I'm trying to say is perhaps these are really well intentioned mo- intended moves that these churches you've surveyed have made, um, absolutely. but they've absolutely missed the mark from what you're saying. Yeah, and I would just say, without a doubt, what the really good news is that churches are express, you know, are really explicit in their care for young people. In other words, they they name it often that we care about the young people. We want young people here. We want to include them. They support financially the youth programs, and they they attempt to do all of these various kinds and, and of things. And even to perhaps give them some control in the process. Sure, and they, they, they um, tout youth leadership. All of those things are really good places to start. So it's not as if we're you know, totally you know, behind the eight ball and there's no way of catching up. I think we have to sort of take it from there and say, okay, but what are we doing with the young people? An example would be uh, one of the churches, the youth, a common complaint amongst the youth was that after they would go into the service and do something, some one service they had a, a play that they would do or um, a musical that the youth would do, after the worship service, the people in the, in the congregation were all so excited, but the way they expressed that excitement was to go up to the young person's parent and say, wow, little Susie did such a great job up there, or Mark did such a great job out there, but they didn't turn and say it to Mark or to Susie who were standing right there. In other words, our, our, our well-intentioned, well-meaning, you know, we get them up and we try and include them, but then we forget that People want to be included like young people want to be included like everybody else wants to be included, which is to form a relationship with the person themselves. That's a simple example, but it's a poignant one. I think. Well, sure, well, sure. So then, I would imagine out of this research you're doing, you and you, since you know you, you, it's, it's ongoing or it's, it's not not yet uh, come to too many conclusions, you are getting a sense of, of best or better practices for congregations to take in mind. And I wonder if you've got a couple of those articulated. Well, I would say one is to find ways of not working against yourself, which is, you know, if you're thinking about how do we involve young people within the worship life of our congregation, one of the simple ways is by not planning things that, uh, that take young people out of worship to begin with. So, um, you know, many of these churches, they had the Sunday school hour during the worship service that was most well attended by the adults within the congregation. Um, now, I recognize that churches are going to be bigger and you're going to have multiple worship services and maybe even different kinds of worship services, but I think not actively working against yourself by forcing the young people to sort of only go to this worship service or to have to be in youth group or something like that during the worship service itself, I think that's that's a, a really good place to start. Oh, which is very interesting because I'd like to tease that out because I think certainly a lot of viewers, myself included, have, have had those debates about... 
Um, you know, you certainly want to take into account the convenience of the, the parents uh, who would like to come to, school, to, to, to church and have their children have some sort of a, a spiritual engaging experience. Um, and, and they see that when they're in the adult service, perhaps they aren't getting that. And maybe that's why they do these younger services. But what you're saying, that, that, that may not be true. Yeah, well, I just think, think about what it says to a young person about what church is for them to send them out of the worship service to their own sort of, you know, this, this worship service isn't really for you. This is for adults. You're not going to understand this, and we're not going to take the time to explain it to you. We'd rather have you ha have your little worship service over here. Now, I'm, I'm exaggerating the point. Certainly churches don't say, say it quite like that, yeah. but, they, but they do, you know, whether that it's informally or not, uh, implicitly express that by the way in which they structure the organization of Sunday morning or Sunday night or whatever, whenever that corporate worship service is for the, for the congregation. So, so you would make the argument that, you know, uh, th this is, you know, Jesus is intergenerational and the community best, um, uh, best, uh, uh, best practice is to model that in congregational worship, that we keep younger people there not only for the good of the adults, but for the good of the kids. Yeah, and I think the young people have something to offer to the worship service, just like the older members have something to offer to the younger people. I, I mean, I became interested in this whole idea because I was serving at a church in Chicago, and over the course of about four weeks, we started noticing uh, many older adults coming into the church, uh, all from the same church down the street, and they were 60-plus who were coming into the church. And one Sunday I said, you know, I I'm so glad you're here. But can you tell me why all of all of your friends, all from the same church, have come down? And they said, "Well, our church made a decision about uh, you know a few months ago to hire a new minister who, because he was interested in youth ministry, and we wanted to bring in young people, and we, we really wanted to build our, up the young people within our congregation. And he came in a month ago, and the first thing he did was to disband the choir, to choir, to fire the choir director." to uh, take all the pews out of the worship space, out of the sanctuary, and to put up two gigantic screens in front of the church and hire a band. And on the first Sunday that band was playing, he said to the older members of the congregation, many of whom had been there their whole life, 50 years, 60 years, and said to them, if you don't like the music, turn off your hearing aids. And for me, I thought, I can't, and now clearly not all churches are, are ant, as antagonistic towards older members, um, but there has to be a way of attracting young people, about keeping young people, about developing meaningful faith in young people without alienating the older members who have such a huge, important role in developing that faith in young well, people. Well, yeah, and if your research is true that uh, kids aren't finding, experiencing God in worship anyway, um, all you've done is really shrink the place. Yeah, 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 that tends to be the case. And I, I think I, I'm not making an argument for contemporary worship or for traditional worship. I, I really want to stay away from that conversation because it's out there. And I actually think you can have meaningful worship in either. But, uh, but both kinds have problems with weight. I mean, both, both kinds of worship and both styles of worship have problems with magnitude. Okay. So okay. one of the other best practices I would suggest is over and over again when I asked young people, you know, what's the part of the worship service that you dread? Their answer was always, 100% of the young people I interviewed said sermons. Okay? Now, as a preacher myself and as someone who has to stand up on Sunday morning and say something meaningful, that is a pretty daunting statement that, that the young people said. Now, I don't think the sermon itself is bankrupt. That could be, I could take my research that way and say, well, clearly sermons are... Putting a video or whatever because it's not yeah, working. Yeah, I say... Um, I actually think, because when I asked young people for an experience, their favorite worship service, they would often name a time, usually not in their congregation, when they were at a worship service and a message spoke to them. Gotcha. I think there's something about the sermon that's, that's meaningful, but what I think so often as pastors, we, take, we don't take enough time with our sermons. We allow all of the other burdens of ministry, which are huge and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. legion. To take up our, our time that we don't focus as much time as we should on sermons. 
And even when we do, we don't take the time outside of our sermons to actually build some relationships with young people. I think they'll, they're willing to forgive a bad sermon if you've taken the time to, to meet them outside of it. For well, sure. Well, from what you're saying, every sermon's a bad sermon. But the the um, uh, the and and I would ask that it, because you've taken the position that the sermon is in fact redeemable. Um, yeah. What is there uh, that uh, those of us who write sermons or contribute to their, um, you know, the, the, to, to to help shape them? What is there we should be paying attention to? Uh, you know, when w- because we do have young people in our services. Yeah. Well, one is, I think, if we're thinking about the issue of magnitude and weight, yeah. I think one of the pieces we should ask ourselves is, are we simply just saying what the new commentator on Mark has to say about this passage, right? Are we just giving a simple exegesis of the passage, or are we actually attempting to connect it to the world in some way and, and offer weight it within the message itself? I think that, that maybe is a, an obvious one, but the other piece, and I think more importantly, is working on being who we are authentically. I mean, authenticity is one of those other buzz words that gets tossed around as often as, you know, all the time. But one of the pieces that I think is often missed is young people want you to be the same person in the pulpit that you are outside of the pulpit. And if you are willing to do that and they see that, then I think they're willing to forgive a lot and listen to you in a way that they aren't, if not. Sure, sure, sure. So so then does that make a case for personal anecdotes, uh, or certainly the personal processing of, uh, of the information that you're sharing, and that that might be a, 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 a you know, a plug. I, I often like to think of sermons as kind of like, like, like highways, and people kind of get off some exits, and sometimes they never, never get back on again. Yeah, but, yeah. So you always want to provide entrance ramps also, so that sure. people can, 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 can get back on it, because our minds drift over the course of however many minutes. But the uh, but so this would be kind of an entrance ramp. Would be some sort of sense of this really had, has grabbed me. Right, and I think passion goes into that. It's not always just. In other words, it doesn't have to be every sermon you start. You know, well, I once had this happen to me, and therefore you should think about how it affects you. I think it can be the passion with which you approach it, the um, honesty with which you approach the scripture. That when there's a problem with it, when there's a challenge, and if you're from a uh, you know, denominational background that you think there are sometimes challenges with the scripture. You know, if you're willing to name those out loud and to say, and help the young people and the, not just young people, help the people who are there struggle through it with you. I think that that can go a long way towards adding some magnitude and helping young people and people in general figure out why it matters. Right. Um, I would also bring up uh, in, 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 an obvious question, which is, is there something wrong with the, and I'm guessing when you say a sermon, it's a 10 to 20 minute exposition on scripture, you brought up exegesis, that uh, it, w- would there be another style, perhaps more dialectic, or one in which you, you called on people or included video or drama or any of these things that would make any kind of a difference in terms of piquing the, uh, and I don't want to say the interest, because I don't want to make this like entertainment, but, but, but uh, to, to connect, to aid to the connection with young people? It's a good question, and it's one I've been struggling with as I'm uh, working on this dissertation. Part of, part of my answer is to say, yeah, absolutely, some of those could really help, but only if that is what is natural to you, right? Just trying these new things because they, uh, you know, I'm attempting this, this new kind of sermon because I've been told it helps me connect to youth. I think is really going to work against the person. For instance, in in some of the services, uh, so one of the things I did with the young people I interviewed was I recorded all of the worship services at a church for the for a weekend, and then I brought in some anywhere from five to eleven youth and sat in a group and watched the worship service with them. And we paused it at various places and talked with them about okay, what was going on here? What do you like here? And one of the places that each of the churches, um, or two of the churches, they, they wanted to watch the contemporary service. And in the contemporary service, there is this often part, this pause between songs that happens. So typically, it's there's three songs in the beginning, a, a reading of the scripture, a prayer, and then the sermon, and then uh, some more songs, and it's done, right? That's the order of the service. Typically, between those three songs at the beginning, there's this conversation that happens where the it's basically vamping while they you know, get their new instruments out or whatever it happens. 
but they were they universally panned that moment as completely inauthentic because the person almost always does something like it's so great to be here today. Don't you just love that song? You know, well, the next song is Children of God, and we're all children of God, so let's sing it together. You know, something that is, the person is trying so hard to keep it going and keep up the energy, but the young people, like I said, can smell a rat, and when they see it, they pounce on it. Yeah. So I just think that they, that those are moments that I think we just, we can't just try something because we think that that's, that's what it is. We. I, I think we have to talk to the young people in our congregations and really work on being as authentic as we can. And so if it, if it helps to have a dialectical sermon and that works for you, okay, great. But if not, then do it the way that, that works best for you, but work on it with young people and ask them, did that work for you? Is there anything I can do to help? I mean, I think that can go a long way. Okay. Um, so if I'm, if I'm understanding you right, Stephen, um if if you if you can bring up these issues of weightiness and authenticity into your sermon um, delivery, it's great. But if you have a hard time doing that, you mentioned this earlier, connecting with young people outside of the service, um, absolutely. Maybe you know I, I often think that uh, worship, uh, adult worship, and the more liturgical or orthodox or whatever your 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 style is, um, the more maturity it asks of its members so that uh, kids by their definition are not mature yet and so they're not going to be able to understand um, the, the, the nuances etc that, that, that are, are happening in, in text uh, um, explanation or in, in, in the, the meaning and history of songs or liturgy if you will um, so then keeping them uh, so then loving them or embracing them or finding a way to make them feel like they're really loved and appreciated even though they may not have the maturity yet to to understand fully what's going on in service becomes really important absolutely and I, and I think you know they're not going to know what these symbols and rites and traditions mean unless we take the time to help them understand why they're important to us and frankly we don't know why they're important to us often and that's the, I mean, so the National Study of Youth and Religion has taught us that, you know, basically the problems are not, and we're, we're sort of missing the mark by focusing on the young people because the problem is with the church itself. Mm-hmm. And, and that parents tend, are um, the number one, the number one predictor of a young person's faith is the faith of his or her parents, right? And you know, even as an adult, the number one predictor of an adult's faith was the faith of his or her parents, right? That's not the only way someone can come to faith. But parents, as I've talked to them, don't know why it matters either. And so helping each of them make some sense of what's going on, I think, is really important. But it also turns out that the rituals and the rites are important to young people. That over and over again, as we, as I talk to them, they're saying things like, well, you know, I really like the silent time within the worship service, which totally surprised me. I thought, oh, they would probably hate that. Um, but they said, no, I really actually appreciate that time, and it helps me sort of focus and to turn, you know, I'm not answering a text. I'm not you know, doing any of those other things. I'm just having a moment with God, and I can name whatever's on my heart. That's interesting to and, me. And I would ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the kinds of things that did resonate with young people when you did your polling, one of them silence. Yeah, one of the si- silence tended to be pretty important. And, you know, even though this, the part that they dreaded was the sermon, when the sermon was good, they really, that was important to them. So, like I said, the, some could express, uh, well, this, when a me- service was meaningful, it was often because a sermon connected in some way, okay. uh, even though it is, uh, it's the part that they dread. Uh, the music tended to be a really important piece. And this one of the things that surprised me, although it's been confirmed by people like Robert Withnow and some other friends who are doing research in this area and colleagues, um, is that you know, I was expecting them to say, I really I can't stand the hymns and I prefer to only have the sort of contemporary music. Each of these churches had an option for that. But uh, most of the youth, like I said earlier, except the ones who had an active part in that contemporary service, preferred to sing the hymns. Hmm. And there's something about the weight of them. There's something about, um, you know, the fact that other people have sung them. And even though they might not understand all the theology behind them, there's something about participating in it that brings them into, a, that forms them in, in some way. Yeah. So the hymns tended to be an important part. The silence was important. 
Yeah, yeah, which which is which is really interesting because um, that that goes against a lot of I'm sure the thinking and some of the the, the reading that you've um, that, that that you've come across that you know the, one of the big reasons they do this is because they're thinking that this is something that's going to um, appeal. But it's it's your it's your uh, your um, conclusion of the weightiness then that 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 tends to bring that way so uh fascinating stuff that you're doing uh, in in and i'm cons- i'm interested in what larger um uh conclusions you began to touch on it um you you've been able to draw when you talk about that national study on on on, on, on uh, and and i'm thinking about the title of a book called the juvenilization of the american church um mm-hmm. That I haven't read the book, but the title just sticks with me because I, we look at the juvenilization of society and right. and see that perhaps reflected in the church. And so, so many of these questions come to mind, Stephen, about what do we do to then help not simply our young people reach a greater level of maturity, but our older people as well. Right. Well, I, I haven't read that book specifically. I've heard of it, and I've read uh, what a book. Well, I assume from the title the book is about, but. Yeah. Um, I can I get that one, but there's another book that I have read by Marva Dawn called "Reaching Out Without Dumbing Down." Yeah, yeah, that's a classic. It has a very similar. I, I assume that's kind of what it's going for within the title, although it's you know, be careful when you assume. Exactly. Uh, but I would say that uh, you know one of the things that I think we could take away, not just for young people, but from for the older members of the church, is to really just stop for a moment in all of our programs and all the things we're doing and figure out. Why is it that we're doing this? And what is the mission of the church and how is it being continued through this practice or not? And uh, not just the sport formally what's happening. So we can point to the youth group and we can point to the Sunday school classes and we can point to the specific youth group. But if we can stop and say, all right, what are the sort of informal things that are happening within our church? In other words, every time we set up a banquet hall, do we have the youth come in and uh, you know, set up the tables for us or take down the tables for us. That says something to the young people about who they are within the life of the church. But then there's this null curriculum that happens within a church, which is, what are we doing by not doing, you know, what are we saying to the young people by, by not doing this? So if we don't have any young people on any of the committees within the, within the church, if we don't, and, or worse, if we have them on the committees, but they're simply a token voice that doesn't actually have any power, um, I, in my mind, that is actually worse than ha- not having them to begin with. Right. Um, you know, just thinking about what are the what are we doing, and then for me, worship is what we do. And when I ask the question, why does this matter? I always have to start with worship because it's what makes us different than every other you know organization down the road. They can go to the YMCA, they can go to the Boy Scouts, they can go to Girl Scouts, and get a lot of the kind of good people skills that the church often gives, but that's not who we're about. We're about something bigger than that, and worship is what reminds us of that. And if we can't get everybody in worship together, then what's the point of doing anything else? I still think there should be peer-oriented groups. I think it's important to have young adult groups and youth groups, and, but I also think that it, they, those groups don't make sense unless they're grounded within the worship life of a congregation. And I was going to just, and it was going to take us that way too, Stephen. Is that um, what do you then, uh, given the, the the research that you've done, uh, look at as a helpful constellation or best practice of congregational life in terms of um, you know having still available these uh, peer-centered, age-appropriate gatherings, yet at the same time um, uh, worship services. You know what, I, I wish I had a sort of simple answer that all churches, like I said earlier, I don't have that, but one of the, one of the things is figure out what it takes to get everybody in worship together. Hmm. This becomes, I think, one of the challenges of my research is going to be the fact that this becomes really hard with a bigger congregation. The bigger the congregation, the harder it is to do all of this, I think. At a small, I just came from serving a small congregation where we were able to put some of these things into practice, and it felt, and it was good. but. Part of the reason we were able to do it was because we were a small congregation, and uh, frankly, we didn't have all the resources to be able to do those other kinds of things. So we could make worship the main thing, and that turned out to be a really great piece. But you know, being in a larger congregation, though, that becomes harder. For me, I think whatever we can do to build uh, the corporate worship time so that, yes, you might have to have separate worship services simply because of the size of your congregation. But, in terms of having like a 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Or right, whatever. right. But not structuring your the peer-oriented groups uh, so that they coincide. 
And I think that that's a challenge. And, you know, a lot of churches will do an early service and then an educational hour and then another service. I think that that model can really work, uh, but it can be really uh, can be really hard, too. But often the reason cited why that's hard is because parents don't want to go into an educational hour because they just want to come and go to the worship service and have an hour away from their kids. My challenge to that is to say, well, is that an okay way of practicing our faith? Maybe it's good to have a time away. As a parent, I know it is really nice to have a moment away every once in a while. But it's but if we're trying to build lasting faith, that when they're, when parents are expressing that, it's clear to me that they don't understand why this matters. They just think it's I'm checking off my worship passport, you know, stamp, and now I can go on about my business. So I think helping everything we do, helping people understand why the church matters. I mean, I know I, that's, I sound like a broken record, but over and over again, that's what it seems to, what the research seems to indicate. Well, sure, and, and finding, um, finding curriculums and programs and speakers and books and the kinds of things that are going to pique the interest of adults uh, becomes, I mean, you can see why there's such a, a market of diff- marketplace of different places and ideas, because it really is difficult to get that uh, parent and those parents to yeah. stick around for that extra hour. Do you know of any magic bullets or anything that you've seen that's, that tends to be uh, more successful than others or avenues that people might want to explore who, uh, who are watching this? Uh, I don't have a magic bullet, but I would say that one of the things that tends to help churches move towards a more inclusive worship practices are finding ways for intergenerational contact to occur outside of the worship service. Huh. So that instead of thinking about Sunday school hour as simply, okay, what are we going to do with the, the ninth graders and what are we going to do with the you know 40 plus crowd? Um, you know, what if we had some time where those ninth graders and the 40 plus crowd were together? Or maybe you have a senior senior, so like a senior senior school. So or a session where the seniors in high school have a special Sunday school class with, and they're paired up with senior citizens within your congregation that then have some chance to talk about this rite of passage that's coming up as they head into college. And I mean, it just occurs to me, there's lots of different ways that we haven't explored. I mean, one of the things that I'll be doing in the fall at this current congregation that I'm serving is uh, we're doing an intergenerational Bible study on um, the Hunger Games. And so we're just looking at something where all these members of the congregation from young to old have been reading this book and want a place to be able to talk through it and talk about it from a faith perspective. So just simply paying attention to what's going on within the life of the world and uh, you know and in the community of faith and saying okay how can we have multiple conversations well that, that so so really what you're urging us to do is to have ears wide open to perhaps those uh, those cultural um, goings on that are having an intergenerational uh, impact I, I was surprised as anything when my wife who's a who's a, a, a professional, uh, came home and said her book study group was reading that particular book. And I thought, yeah. wow, you know, that, that, isn't that for kids? And, and you know, it, it, it has captivated. But there are other things out there as well, aren't there? Sure, absolutely. And it, it, doesn't, it could be politics. It could be uh, any, any number of things that help you understand the church as a place to come together. And, and it gives a sense of why the church exists, right? So you know, okay, maybe the Hunger Games seems like a silly example of the first, at the onset, but think about the themes in the Hunger Games of, of war and peace, themes of justice and themes of hunger, you know, all of those things that come together that are important that the church has something to say about, and it gives people a, a lens through which to uh, interact in their world. And for me, that, that is a really important piece, and, and so that helps make sense of what's going on in the worship service, and the worship service helps make sense what's going on in that. I think of it sort of as concentric circles, that everything in a church starts with the worship service and then goes out from there, so that if you have these other Bible studies or these other groups or these uh, outreach programs, they all, they, they all only make sense if they're tied in some way to the worship life of a congregation. Okay, so things like a vacation Bible school that, that you might be able to make intergenerational become really important? Absolutely, absolutely, and all I, I mean, and we can start at any age. I happen to be focusing on high school youth, but I've, I've done some research in young adults as well, and all of these play out over and over again. People are looking for meaning, they're looking for belonging, they're looking for hospitality, and we can do these things uh, when we engage within the full life of a congregation, and I think we have this great resource in worship 
to start uh, and to bring people in that we don't utilize because we just think of it as going through the motions and doing what, what we do. And they pick up on it and they don't like it. And frankly, neither do we. <laughs> Right, 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 right. So, so I, give me then, if you can, uh, some best practices for, for church leaders in terms of paying attention to, to young people. Uh, one of them that you're, you're kind of suggesting is, is um, be uh, alert as to what's going on in their worlds, uh, what is, is important or what matters to them. Um, are there other ways that we might sharpen our lenses? Well, I think, you know, so being aware is one thing, although you can get quickly move into the creepy factor of, you know, always hanging out the teen joints, right? So you, you have to be thoughtful about the way in which that's happening. So I would just say um, the best, best practice, the number one practice is to be in conversation with all the people in the congregation, with all the people in your church. I mean, and outside of it, but certainly, you know, too often you hear a senior minister say, well, I'm not the youth minister, so he, you know, he or she focuses on the youth. My job is to work on whomever else in the congregation. I don't know who the person thinks they're, what their job is for if, if it doesn't involve the youth. I think we have to start thinking about you know our vows and baptism is that everybody in the congregation is responsible for everybody else. Yeah. And that we have to figure out some way of, of keeping people through that. One, one of the best practices I think is to find ways of celebrating the rites of passage that happen within youth and, the, and young adult life. So. Okay. Uh, maybe, you know, right now we often have a graduation Sunday. Okay, well that's one thing, but what if that was coupled with conversation that happened prior and after, a, you know, to that, prior to graduation and after graduation about, okay, so what does it mean to be a person of faith as you move away from this congregation and how do we support you in this congregation if you're going to college and if you're staying here and going to school or not going to school, how do we support you through that? What does it mean to have a church home and how do you find a church home outside of this place that you've known as home? Uh, but beyond that, I mean, what if, uh, I mean, I'm going are far out there and other churches might not appreciate it, but I would say, what if, you know, we have all these conversations about um, open be, churches being open and affirming in terms of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, questioning young people. What if uh, the church was a place of celebrating coming out, a, a ways of celebrating sexuality in a way that would be very different than how the church is typically approach those kinds of issues. And, you know, I, I recognize that not all churches would, would be that way, but what if that was a, just paying attention to what's going on within the life of, of young people? Sexuality turns, tends to be not just homosexuality, but sexuality is kind of an important thing in high school. And yeah, it, that's so, it. so what if the church found ways of being intentional about that? Not all of it could happen within the worship service, obviously, but some of it could. And churches can have conversation about what does it what does it mean to use our bodies in these ways, and how are we created? You know, all of these things that they don't hear their ministers talking about, uh, I think, could be really important ways of celebrating and connecting them. Yeah, I mean, we we often um, you know when you uh, when you become an adult, or when even when you get married, you often there, there's this kind of door that closes, and you seem to forget everything that was really really important to you before that point. Um, yeah, and so being in conversation, as you're suggesting, perhaps helps open that door a little bit more. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and in terms of sexuality, it, you know, it is such an important topic, especially for younger people, because of course, biologically, the things that are happening there, uh, and then uh, you know, is sociologically the 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 you know pure amount of emphasis that media, popular media, et cetera, puts puts on these things. Um, have you heard of ways to kind of address these things that, that are, because you, you run into the appropriateness thing, don't you? I mean, you know, you, you, how, how do you in church bring up a subject as, as intimate and delicate and, um, and hot button uh, as, as that? Well, I would say, you know, it's not without its challenges and you have to be thoughtful about the way in which you approach it and honest and open about the way in which you approach it. By the, and the way in which you approach it. But I think we're kidding ourselves if we think that they're not getting it from somewhere else. So why should the church 
be scared to talk about these particular issues, even in their awkwardness, when every time they turn on the television, every other thing that they see is about sexuality. And it's giving a very specific message about sexuality. We have another one, right? So it seems to me this is just another place where I think worship can be a really helpful tool about, I mean, what, is, what does it mean to be embodied people? And what, is it, what does communion mean? What is the Eucharist, if not uh, an expression of who we are in, in and fully embodied and who Christ is and what does it mean to be the body of Christ. And all of those things I think can come into play. I think sermons are really important here. And if you want somebody to sit up and pay attention to a sermon, try talking about sex, right? I mean, certainly it's, it's important and we have something to say about it, so we ought to say it. And not just simply the message that's usually out there, which is just don't do it, it's wrong, end of story. But talking through, okay, you might think that, but if that's the case, then offer some understanding why. Help us work through this because we're human beings and this is kind of an important part of who we are. Yeah, to, to say the least, do you, do you think churches talk enough about sex? Not at all, no. I think typically if they talk about sex, it's sometimes about homosexuality um, or not. You know, Some churches don't talk about that issue at all. In the Methodist church, it tends to be a big issue right now that we're, we're struggling through. But, um, you know, Churches will have a night during youth group where they talk about sex, and that's it. And then next year there'll be another one, and then that's it. But what if churches took on the role of, um, you know, uh, talking about help, helping not just through the moral aspect of it, but about the physical aspect? We help parents understand how to talk to their young people about their sexuality. So we're supporting young people and parents in raising the young people so that they they understand from perspective of not just do this or don't do this or if you're going to do this be safe about it but helping them understand that what we do with our bodies matters as people of faith not just because we could catch a disease or get pregnant mm -hmm. it matters because we're created beings and there's and and God wants you know wants us to do specific kinds of things with our bodies so um, and to use them well, right? So all of these kinds of things we can have, we can support people in conversations about this. Well, there, there's this sense then that, that, that uh, we can go places where God isn't. We're, we're, I mean, God is present with us at, at every moment, with every thought that's going through our mind, with everything that we're doing. Um, then it, it, it's a way to remind ourselves that, you know, it, there's not, no place you can go without God. I mean, God is watching over that part of your life too. Yeah. And what an important message for young people to hear who uh, maybe have struggled with particular issues in sexuality to know that there's a place where they can openly talk about this. I mean, what does it mean to, I mean, we've all, you know, I mean, as we can have any view of sexuality that we want, but we all have moments where we feel like that wasn't as healthy as it could have been, right? Or whatever, wherever we are, and how important would it be to understand and to constantly remember that we are redeemed people that, uh, and, we, and part of why I focus on worship is because you know, worship, when done well, reminds us over and over again of who we are in God's sight, that we're redeemed people, that we can confess our, both our faith and our sins and, and have assurance of God's love for us. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a really important thing to remind people that we miss when we just simply go through the motions or that we allow young people, uh, you know, to be outside of the worship service. I mean, we all miss it. Sure, so I, sure, I sure. Have to take it more seriously. Um, and, you know, Stephen, as we wind up here, I always like to ask at the end of our interviews if there's anything that you came to the interview wanting to express that we haven't touched on or if there's anything during the interview that came up that you'd like to elaborate on or if you've got any kind of encouraging or parting words to the folks who are listening. You know what? Uh, that's a good question. I wrote some notes beforehand, so let me just look really quickly and make sure that I haven't... Uh, Totally. I had not intended to speak about sex at all, so there's that. There's that. Uh, no, take your time. That's the beauty of the Internet. Um, you know, I would just say that one of the things that churches ought to do and it is to follow through on the promises that they're making to young people, uh, both in their baptism, but within, you know, if we say youth are important within congregations, and we build these youth programs and we fund these youth programs and we fund these youth ministers. I, I think we have to follow through even further and actually be with the young people. And that means not simply in a way of, um, you know, we're just going to set aside this pew within our congregation and say, you sit there on Sunday morning, though some young people will do that themselves. Um, 
you know, but finding ways of actually including them within the life of the church legitimately and have legitimate participation within the life of the church in the same way that everyone else participates. Mm -hmm. and, 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 would, are you in favor of kind of what you, churches might call youth Sundays or of, of having a special time when young people can really be in charge of everything? I think those, are, uh, those can be a really meaningful day and meaningful time, but I think the challenge is oftentimes when churches do youth Sundays, they sort of get it done with for the year, and then the youth for the next 51 weeks aren't involved within the life of the, of the worship service. Now, that's, I think it's better than not having them at all, but I also think it would be a better witness to the church if, if we had that maybe in addition to, um, you know, committing to have a youth preach every once in a while, not on a weird Sunday, but on a, you know, a Sunday, you know, and just coming and, you know, not just because the senior minister is going to, going to be away, but to say, we think what you have to say is important and we're going to support you and, and not just put them out there cold, but support them through it. I mean, so I don't know, that's one way of going about it or finding other ways to have them participate in the liturgy. And I want to be clear that participation within a worship service is not simply standing up in front of everyone, that we are all participating within the, within the worship service, even when we're sitting and never say a word, uh, but finding ways of legitimate participation where you're, you feel like you're participating is different than just sitting there because your parent wants you there or because your son or daughter, uh, you feel like your son or daughter needs to be there. Steve and Katie, thank you for sharing uh, some of your research uh, that you're doing into uh, youth, young adults, and church. We look forward to where it takes you, and thanks for being my guest on Church Next. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time that you spent.